Okay, welcome again uh, to this series of uh, the Sahib Living History 2019. And I'm pleased to have Dr. Benjamin Schneider here. Uh, like I said, we'll do about 40 minutes of an interview and then we'll have some time afterwards for questions. So we're gonna start with um, some pictures from the very early life of Dr. Schneider that he was kind enough to share with me. Okay, so very early on, um, you were telling me that you were always a worker and that that tended to work well for you. Can you talk a little bit about your work ethic? I have some jobs listed that you had. Some of them were quite interesting, like the Coke machine operator. Um, can you talk a little bit about your work ethic, how that developed in some of those jobs? Sure. First, th <clears throat> thank you all for being here. The thing I like about the title is that it said living. So it's, um, I, I really appreciated that. And, and I do appreciate you coming. Thanks. Um, what, my father was a worker. And he decided that his children would also be workers. And so from the time I was about 11, I, I was uh, expected to give my father one day a week so either Saturday or Sunday, to work with him around the house and take care of things. So I've, I've been uh, painting and whitewashing and cementing and doing brickwork and gardening and stuff since I'm about 10 or 11, ever since we moved out of Brooklyn. So that picture of me roller skating, that's when I was about nine. We moved from Brooklyn, New York to Croton on Hudson, New York when I was 10. So Croton is about 35, 40 miles north of New York City, and my father commuted into New York City and back every day. He, he, he worked in Manhattan. And he, he, wasn't very, he wasn't strict or nasty or ugly, and he didn't beat me, and he didn't do you know, these child abuse kinds of things, but the expectation was clear that I, I was going to work and I was going to learn how to work. And he was very competent in terms of uh, plumbing and painting and woodwork. And, you know, he was really a competent homeowner. And we did all of the work around the home. I recently went back to visit that house in Croton. And when I was a kid, we had planted about a dozen pine trees. And when I went back to visit it, you couldn't see the house anymore. Because <laughs> the pine trees had gotten so big. But anyway, this started this whole work thing. I started earning money when I was 14, um, first with a paper route and then helping neighbors with their gardening. And so ever since then, I've, I've worked. And uh, I recently told someone that my middle name was Persistence. So I've, I've always been a persister. I can, I, can, I can work at things for a long time and, and uh, keep at it and stuff. And I've been unbelievably lucky because all of the things that I work at and keep at, I really love doing. So it's, it's like this thing about being connected and involved and committed and enjoying. That combination has just worked terrifically for me for my entire life and career. So now moving on just a little bit um, to your undergraduate experience. So Alfred University, where two quite important things happened. Um, you found IO psychology, something that maybe industrial psychology at the time, uh, and also Brenda, who had not a very big, uh, not only a very big personal impact on your life, but my understanding is she's much of the reason you're sitting here today in terms of your education as well. Can you talk a little bit about that time? Sure. Yeah, so there, there have been a number of wonderful things that have happened to me in my life. One of the number one is Brenda. And I, I met Brenda when I was a freshman at college. The last thing that I expected to ever happen to me when I was a freshman at college was that I was going to meet someone I wanted to spend my life with. And uh, unfortunately, it hit me very early on. And it didn't hit her 
very early on. So remember I said that my middle name was Persistence. And uh, I persisted and eventually took about a year, a year and a half, um, she agreed to go out with me. And then I kind of booked her up. And uh, she's been, we just celebrated our 58th anniversary. And uh, it's been a, a wonderful run in our lives together. And so that's the number one thing. And number two thing was uh, I, t I, I, I was a psychology major and a business minor. I mean, after I took my first course in accounting, I knew I wasn't gonna be a business major. So um, I took the accounting and then I heard about this thing called industrial psychology. And the only time they offered a class in industrial psychology was, was in what we used to call summer, summer school, right? Summer school. Summer session, and uh, I stayed one summer and uh, took that class and fished for trout and had a really nice summer. And uh, I thought, you know, that was pretty cool, industrial psychology. And when we were getting ready to graduate, uh, Brenda said, you know, you're, gonna, you're going to have to go for a more advanced degree than just this undergraduate degree. And I was in ROTC to help pay my way through college in addition to running the Coke machine and being steward of the fraternity and house manager of the fraternity and all of those things that you do to save money. Um, I, I, had no pl I, I had plans to become a Sears Roebuck store manager. And um, she indicated that that wasn't going to do the trick. And so, I, to make a long story short, I went and got an, the first MBA in industrial psychology ever offered at the Baruch School in uh, City University of New York. So that turns out to have been really good. And I became a student in taking those classes. I, I hadn't been much of a student at Alfred University, but I became a student in that program because I had great great teachers, uh, especially a, a guy named Angelo Dispenzeri, who I took my first really important, serious class on psychological theory from him. Some of you old timers will remember this book by Marx on uh, theories, theories of psychology. And that just sort of grabbed me, and uh, I've been interested in this stuff ever since. Uh, so the, na the natural next step then was to go on to a PhD program, but there was a little problem with that plan, and that was that you owed the Army some years. And so my understanding is that it was a choice between the, inf the infantry to become an airborne ranger uh, and a path that would maybe lead you a little closer to school. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I graduated with a reasonable average in college because I took ROTC, and I got A's in all of my classes in ROTC. It, it turns out I was a really good shot and um, on the rifle range. So they, they promoted that uh, facet of my uh, being and indicated that I had a, potentially, a potential future in the Army. Um, Brenda didn't think this was a terrific idea. And my mother said that it was definitely not a good idea. And so after the master's degree, they wouldn't let me keep going for the PhD um, because I owed them the two years. And so I, I, I applied for a branch transfer from the infantry to the adjutant general corps. And I was a testing officer in St. Louis, Missouri for a couple of years. I, I was a second lieutenant when I went in, obviously. Got promoted to a first lieutenant. But my grandmother used to tell everyone that her grandson was a general. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll move on to talk a little bit about your PhD program. But first, can you tell everybody why you call Lee your $25 baby? Oh, yeah, Lee, we, we have two. Children, I guess you, you can still say they're children. I mean, but they're obviously 
probably older than many of the people in the audience here. Uh, Lee, our son, uh, was born in St. Louis, and since I was in the Army, um, he was born in a St. Louis hospital, but we only had to pay $25. For, for everything connected with his birth, because there, there wasn't a post hospital. So uh, we were in downtown St. Louis. So yeah, we, we call him the $25 baby. Um, he's a lawyer, works in Manhattan. He, he commutes between London, Hong Kong, and Blacksburg, Virginia. So uh, he's, he's around the world quite a bit. Our daughter, her name is Rhody. That's R H O D Y. Some of you know the song, right? Go tell Aunt Rhody. Go tell Aunt Rhody. So uh, we originally named her um, Rhoda, but we called her Rhody, so we changed her birth certificate so it's official. Rhody, and she's in a she's an independent accountant in Tucson, Arizona. So we have five grandchildren, three with Rhody, two with Lee, and uh, they are the third most important thing in my life, um, the grandchildren. We'll, we'll talk more about them later. Um, so during your PhD program, I, I understand that you had 10 comprehensive exams, just for anybody out here who was feeling sorry for themselves. <laughs> Uh, in that PhD program, is there anything you wanted to talk about in terms of in terms of your work or how that helped to develop you? Well, I got really lucky. Um, when we eventually got to Maryland for the PhD program, I, I had applied before I went into the Army. And, and when it became clear that I had to go serve, I wrote them a letter and said, you know, could we delay it two years while I, I serve my time? And they agreed. And then we got to Maryland in August, August of 1964. It was school about to start in September and I went in and I told them who I was and they said, who are you? And I, I indicated that I was the guy who had asked for a two-year extension on my admission. And they said, well, we have no such record of, of you doing that. And therefore, not only don't we have a record, but you don't have an assistantship either. Well, see, I had been in the Army, and I learned that you keep every piece of paper. In those days, you kept paper. I had kept every piece of paper, and I had the letters from them saying, yes, you can have the extension. But they still didn't have the money. So my first semester in graduate school at the University of Maryland, I took 15 graduate hours. And I had a 30 hour a week job. And so the future for, for graduate students who I worked with later who complained about how much work they had to do, it didn't fly with me. So it, it, that was the big impression. The second impression was that I, I passed the first semester, which I actually didn't think I was going to, but I did. And I met this guy, Jack Bartlett. Some of you know Jack Bartlett or remember Jack Bartlett. And Jack had, next to my father, probably the biggest influence on me for my career and my life. And why was that? It was because he treated me like a brother. He wasn't that much older than I was. He had his PhD from Ohio State University in Educational Measurement and Statistics. And he involved me in everything he did from the time I got to the University of Maryland. I mean, I would be in his office and I would help him prepare his classes and he would help me prepare my classes and when I had anything that I needed to discuss about how I was doing or what I was doing or how I was progressing or anything, he took me to my first industrial psychology meeting at the American Psychological Association. It was in Chicago. 
and he drove 10 hours from Maryland to Chicago, and we drove back together. He involved me in a project he did with the Peace Corps in Puerto Rico. I mean, he, he was like, he completely involved me in everything and every facet of industrial psychology, and he was just a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful role model. And I tried to do the same thing for the students that I worked thereafter. So I had students working on projects, doing exactly the same kinds of things that Jack had done for me. So I'm trying not to get too emotional about his situation and him, but uh, one of the books I've written, I dedicated to him. Um, he's just a wonderful human being. So moving on um, to your first job and um, then a lot of time at Maryland thereafter. Uh, when we were talking, you said that you combined science and practice and, and um, you didn't really even have to try or, or it was almost effortless for you. Um, and my sense is maybe that started a little bit at Yale. Or, and so talk a little bit about Yale and then um, take us through some of your other academic jobs. Yeah, people tell me I can't hold a job. <laughs> I, I, do, I do move around. Um, well, first let me say about this uh, science practice issue that Milt so lovingly always discusses in, uh, you know, in his unbelievable role with the foundation. Um, because of my experience with Jack and him involving me in the projects that he was doing, I thought this is the way you do industrial psychology, right? You do research and you, you do it in organizations with companies. I mean, that's what industrial psychology is about. And so I, I just always continue that. Um, the first job at Yale was amazing because it was like this spectacular postdoctoral fellowship that I had for four years. So y you all will recognize some of the names of the other people there at the time. It was Chris Argerus and Ed Lawler and Richard Hackman, and Clay Aldifer, and Roy Lewicki, and Garrett Wolf. I mean, just like an unbelievable group of people. And, and most of them were about the same age as I was, so we were learning together. And we, and we actually did work together, and we had um, basketball team. I was the, I was the coach of the administrative science basketball team in the New Haven League, for crying out loud. I, I sometimes feature myself as a once speedy guard, you know? And uh, this is my favorite time of the year, actually, for basketball with the uh, NCAA tournament. Okay, so I did the Yale thing. We were there for four years. Uh, there were always issues about getting promoted at Yale, so a lot of people didn't get promoted and a lot of people left, and I went back to Maryland. They, they invited me back, and uh, Jack and Irv Goldstein, my wonderful colleague at Maryland, the two of them invited me back, and we went, and we stayed there for probably seven, eight years, maybe, and then I went to Michigan State as the first John A. Hanna Professor of Psychology and Organizational Behavior. That was a nice chaired professorship. We stayed there three years, went back to Maryland. We keep going back to Maryland. Went back to Maryland and stayed there probably another 20 years. Um, I always took my sabbaticals. So we had sabbaticals in some interesting places. Uh, we, we, we were forced to spend six months in Aix-en-Provence in France. We were forced to spend six weeks in Beijing, we were forced to spend six months at, in Hanover, New Hampshire, at Dartmouth. So we, we've gotten around a few, day, few places, and one of the most dramatic sabbaticals was actually on a Fulbright to Israel. 
And we were in Israel during the Yom Kippur War. That's 1973-74. That was an interesting experience, which I can elaborate on sometime if you'd like me to. And uh, yeah, we've kept moving. Stayed at Maryland. And then I retired there in uh, 15 years ago now, 2003. We moved to California. I have an affiliate appointment at the University of Southern California. I do research with the Center for Effective Organizations. I, I don't seem to be able to quit, probably because I don't want to. And I keep doing projects and doing books and articles and so forth. And Gary Latham keeps telling me I should send him an article, you know, and so forth and so forth. It's just been, I, I'll probably use this term too many times, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful run in this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful field with these unbelievably wonderful people who become industrial and organizational psychologists. It's great. That's my favorite picture. <laughs> I like that picture too. I don't really have much to say about it, except I'm not sure how you had any time with everything you were doing to be anywhere in, in the woods. Uh, so now maybe a couple of minutes talking about your PSYOP presidency, which was, I, I guess it was, was it Division 14 presidency and then partway through maybe became PSYOP? Well, I was not responsible for us becoming PSYOP, but I signed the papers that made us PSYOP while I was president. Because in 1986, we became PSYOP when Irv Goldstein actually was president of PSYOP. And that was, of course, the first conference was 1986. Some of you weren't born yet, but we had a conference. 600 people is my recollection were at the first conference in Chicago at the Chicago Marriott, 1986. What is 3,600 here this time? So that's pretty nice. We've had a, a good growth spurt. Um, it, until you become president or serve on the board of SIOP, you you can't possibly imagine all of the issues that have to be simultaneously dealt with. I think you got some hint of it if you went to hear Talia Barra this morning. I mean, the, the number of things that are going on, and at that time we had very strong separation anxiety with regard to APA. So we were in, in heavy interaction with the American Psychological Association. And um, the most magnificent thing about being president of the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology is the help you get from all of the people who are simultaneously serving on the board with you. It's, you know, I see Mort is nodding his head. I mean, it's, well, you're in PSYOP, so it's like I'm preaching to the choir, right, about the amazing people that you meet in this, in this wonderful society. But it's not words. It's actually what people do. And, and it's, it was just a terrific experience and just further solidified my, uh, my wonder at my luck of wandering into this thing with a summer course at Alfred University. So um, one of the things that you said to me is that you're compulsive about how larger units behave. I wonder if you want to talk um, a little bit about your, um, you also had a recent uh, tip commentary where you were talking about some things that the field, you think the field needs to think about. I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about that. She asked good questions. Um, so I think I said earlier that Jack Bartlett had been measurement and statistics 
uh, PhD from Ohio State University. So he wanted me to take my second specialty. Oh yeah, you asked about the 10 exams. So we had to take an, an exam in our major, and then we had to have a second specialty. So my major was industrial psychology, my first specialty. Second specialty, everyone in industrial psychology took measurement as their second specialty except me. So I took social psychology as my second specialty because I was convinced I wasn't going to pass my first semester <laughs> because I had to pass the damn statistics class. And statistics and me, I understand the theory behind a lot of it, but I don't, the, the calculations just, you know, escape me. And, and if you confront me with a formula, I, I have never been able to understand what all those X's and Y's and subscripts and all those other things attached to them mean. So I took social psychology. And, and I read this book by uh, Ed Schein, 1965. It was the first edition of his book called Organizational Psychology. It was a little paperback. And I was completely blown away by it and it changed my entire career. Why did it change my career? It changed my career because I learned that you could think about the social situation that people are in and the effects they have on them rather than just their individual differences, right? I mean, measurement, statistics, you know, the whole personnel selection thing. I mean, I've actually written, you know, I have a book in three editions on staffing organization. So it's not that I don't think that's important, but I don't think it's the only important thing in IO psychology. So I have spent most of my career doing research above the level of analysis of the individual. So my, my earliest research, research on uh, service climate was on branches of banks, not the individual in the branches of banks, but on the branches of banks at that unit of analysis. And I, I think that we can have an even bigger impact than we've had in organizations at the individual differences level if we also focus on the organizational level of analysis. Because these psychological principles that we have easily get elevated to other levels of analysis besides the individual. And so, um, I, I think maybe the thing I'm best known for is this thing called The People Make the Place, an article I wrote. And that was my attempt to take psychological principles, personality, and ask what would an organization look like if the people in it were of a more similar sort than we think are, happens as a natural course of events. And there's, there's actually probably a dozen, 15 studies now in the literature that show that that's true, that people do con tend to congregate. It's not like everybody, I never said everybody was gonna be the same, you know, but they're, they're more like each other than they're like people in other places. And so some people have overinterpreted what, what, I, what I had to say. But, but this, this, natural inclination of people to be with others who are similar, that applies to where they end up working and, and who they work with and who they maybe even work best with. So the, the, I think the organizational level of analysis requires more attention by more IO psychologists. The other thing that I, th I think we have not done a good job of is uh, looking at reciprocal relationships. So it's almost impossible to find a study in the IO psychology journals that, that study reciprocal relationships. I know you had to do it over time and stuff like that, you know, and that's a problem. And getting companies is a problem to do organizational levels. I understand all the problems, I've been through them. But especially the reciprocal relationship thing. I mean, we're talking about natural systems and we treat them as if they only go left to right. Right, you know, you never see arrows that go right to left. All those arrows go in those boxes left to right. 
And that's not the way natural systems work. They, they actually reciprocate. So I think we should be do, doing uh, reciprocating kind of stuff at the organizational level of analysis. And I know it's tough, but Maggie asked me, and I, I think that's a direction, an additional direction in which we should go. So no one should leave here saying Schneider said we should drop that individual differences stuff, right? I didn't say that. <laughs> All right, the last thing that I, that I wanna have Ben talk a little bit about, a little bit more about is his family. Um, and so there are a couple of pictures here and then uh, a beautiful picture of Ben and Brenda on the next slide. So the picture on the left is uh, my son, Lee, my daughter, Rhody, Brenda, and is there someone else in the picture there? No. So that, we were in Seattle uh, when we took that. Um, we've, uh, Br Brenda has been a, a wonderful partner in a thousand different ways. I, I recently was walking home from a meeting I attended, and I said, gee, I wonder what Brenda's making for dinner. And then I stopped for a second and I said, I wonder how many dinners Brenda has made. Some of you have, have had the pleasure of uh, eating at our homes and attending dinners that Brenda's done or parties we used to have for students and stuff like that. She's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful cook. So I did a quick calculation at, at only five meals a week, thinking that at only five meals a week, I came up with the number 17,500. So, I mean, we're talking lots of, lots of dinners. The other thing that Brenda does is she feels it's essential that every member of our family understand that they are a member of this family and they, they are there to depend on each other, to love each other, and to respect each other, and so forth. So we get the entire family together at least once a year, mostly at Thanksgiving time, but in most years, two at least two other times, and then we interact with them, not as a whole family, but periodically um, throughout the year. So the, the, the family is, central to the way I think of myself and my role in life. So I have my career, and I have my family, and I have my friends, and um, it's, it's this matrix package that I, I guess now the metaphor I have in my brain is those awards that were being given out this morning, you know, with the intersecting layers. I mean, I have all these intersecting layers in my life that are comforting and um, enjoyable. And so the family is one of them. Uh, the second picture there is uh, the family. We, we were all together in, uh, in the Berkshires this past summer. And uh, they convinced me that I should go hang gliding. Not hang gliding, zip lining. I actually would like to go hang gliding someplace. But uh, the zip lining. So that was really good. So the, so the last thing before we get to some questions here, um, I reached out to some of Ben's past colleagues and students and um, got a lot of great, uh, wonderful, kind things back. Um, and I kind of tried to code them a little bit because I guess that's what we do. <laughs> um, I'm gonna share all of it with him later, but here are just some some kind of themes. There was definitely this kind and caring mentoring. Um, 
excitement. The word excitement must have come up in everybody's uh, in everybody's memories. Um, of course, smart and um, curious, and then this idea uh, that he is humble and and very earnest. So we'll leave those up there while we move to questions. But these are some of the things that that a few people have said about Ben. You ready for some questions? Ready. ready. Okay. All right, so if anybody has a question, I'll come find you, or a comment, or, okay. Hi, Ben, thank you for sharing your wisdom, it was, and thanks, Maggie, for coordinating it. Uh, my question to you is how have you stayed relevant, or what have you done to continuously learn? And I know research forces you to do that, but is there anything else that you do outside uh, for example, read for a specific number of hours or certain books or uh, would love to learn how have you how have you continued to learn? Why well, I, I, is this on? Yeah, yeah. so <clears throat> I, I think getting away from paper journals was a bad idea because I could I could sort of leave those any place around the house especially in the John, right? <laughs> and, and I could keep up with the literature, you know? You don't have to read every article to keep up with the literature. So what, what you have to do is look through the table of contents and see, see what's going on and try and find something that might be relevant or interesting. So relevant is, you know, something that's tied closely to the stuff that you're working on at the moment. And interesting is, kind of the stuff you might want to work on in the future. So I've always just, you know, looked through the table of contents and looked at, looked at the journals and I continue to do that. And what, you know, these, the Academy, of Man Man the Academy of Management journals tell you with an email that there's these new articles that have been just accepted and if, you know, I look at them and if, I think it might be interesting. I read the abstract, and then if it's something that's really interesting, I'll download the paper. And I still do that. And um, I want, I want, so you can't repeat this, all right? <laughs> I once, I want, someone once asked me a similar kind of question. Why? Well, a lot of people used to call me and ask me for references. It was like, you know, I need a reference on such and such a topic. And somehow uh, I became known as the person who knows references, right? Maybe I didn't know the article, but I remember that. So I, I thought, I, I said to someone once that I was an idiot savant with regard to industrial psychology. <laughs> you know, that I could remember references that I, that I had three by five cards on when I was studying for my exams. That's right. In addition to the specialty and second specialty, I had to take eight exams in different areas of psychology in my PhD program. So I, I mean, I always just found it interesting. You have to hold the mic. <clears throat> All right, thanks for uh, coming today to speak. Um, I have two quick questions. One is, um, can you tell us about this uh, paper you wrote, um, co-authored uh, last year, uh, about workforce level engagement? Um, I had a pleasure reading it, and um, I want you to maybe speak a bit about it, about maybe how did you come to that, um, and maybe what's the differences or the most salient differences between the individual and uh, organizational level engagement. And my second question is, uh, can you tell us a bit about what, because you kind of hinted at it before, what would, uh, what, what kinds of um, advantages does a, a systems perspective have for psychological research and, and I.O. And, and specifically, if, uh, if, you th if, the, if you believe there are any benefits to it? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, the question about uh, the workforce engagement is, uh, for those of you who haven't seen the paper, it's a paper at the organizational level of analysis on, on work engagement. So we had, um, I forget the sample size, 140 something organizations? Yeah, it was a large number of organizations. And uh, 
The interesting thing about the, the way you ask the question is really interesting because it got turned down at one of our fine journals in, uh, that's IO psychology related because they said employee engagement was not an organizational level construct. And uh, I, re I replied to the editor um, when I received that note that uh, they should go read um, David McClellan's work on need for achievement and, and how he started out with it as an individual level construct and turned it into a country level construct. So that, that, that's that principle that I said earlier that these psychological constructs operate at additional levels of analysis and that's what I wanted to show and prove in that paper. Because the, the criterion we had there was, you know, ROI, ROA, ROE, and all of these financial returns, and we were able to show <coughs> that a four item measure of engagement in work aggregated to the country, company level of analysis not only correlates with, but predicts financial returns for companies. So that fits with that idea that I think we should be doing that kind of stuff. And the second, your second? Uh, systems, systems, uh, systems per second. Yeah, so. That, that book that Ed Schein wrote back in 1965 is the, is the, the, the construct issue that for me symbolizes the wholeness of organizations. The, the problem with the wholeness of organizations is the problem that people who want to study organizational culture run into because they don't know what to focus on. Because the, the culture, there is no such a thing as the culture. The, the cultures we talk about in organizations are actually about something. So there's cultures for safety, there's cultures for people, there's cultures for productivity, there's culture. So what I just did is, is give you the way I think about climate, right? That I think of climate as having some focus or foci. The, the problem with doing research on these systems is how many variables are you able to simultaneously study? And that's, that's a, a terribly difficult issue until recently. Well, why do I say until recently? I, well, because with, with data analytics reaching the level of sophistication that we now have, we can handle a very large number of variables simultaneously looking for the systems patterns in them with regard to particular outcomes of interest. I'm still